Welcome to today's Brown Bag Seminar Series, hosted by the Delta Stewardship Council Delta Science Program, along with today's seminar partners. Uh, our partners today are the Delta Protection Commission, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Office of Spill Prevention and Response, and Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Annie Daly is a master's candidate at the UC Santa Barbara's Brent School of Environmental Science and Management. She grew up in Stockton, where she originally became familiar with the Delta. She received her bachelor's in environmental studies from Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. After graduation, she worked in the Bay Area in environmental consulting for five years with a company that primarily focused on NEPA compliance. She went back to get her master's at UC Santa Barbara's Brent School, where she is pursuing a master's of environmental science and management with an emphasis in coastal and marine resource management. She was doing her, she's doing her thesis on the recovery of the hake fishery <laughs> in Chile. This summer, she did an internship with the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. And today, she will talk about the work from her internship, exploring the abandoned vessels in the Delta. Please join me in welcoming Annie Daly. Yeah, so thank you for the introduction. As Nira said, I'm interning with the Office of Spill Prevention and Response, which is the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's oil spill response, response arm. Um, and that work is supported by the Delta Protection Commission, who's supporting my internship this summer. Um, and the Delta Protection Commission is has an interest in recreation and safe navigation in the Delta, so that's kind of how they play into this. Um, as Nair said, I'm going to talk about the issues of abandoned and derelict vessels in the Delta today. So a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to go over the background, what is an abandoned vessel, um, why they're a problem, the current program that exists in California addressing this issue, the Office of Spill Prevention and Responses work in this area, and then we're going to talk about looking forward next steps. First thing to address is what is an abandoned derelict vessel? And the definition varies by state. In California, there's no definition for derelict. Um, but in general, it can kind of mean uh, vessels that, that is dilapidated, unseaworthy, uh, sinking, can no longer be used for its intended purpose, or that its disposal would cost more than the worth of the vessel. California does have a definition for abandoned, which is from the Harbors and Navigation Code, and it's up here. Uh, so any hulk, derelict, wreck, or part of any ship, vessel, or other watercraft sunk, beached, or allowed to remain in an unseaworthy condition for a period of longer than 30 days. I have some examples up here, but um, you might ask, why would someone abandon their vessel? And there's a, a lot of possible reasons, but disposal can be expensive, and people maybe buy boats and don't realize how expensive they are. Um, it's possible to buy unseaworthy vessels very cheap and to you know maybe think you're going to redo them for a fun project and not realize how expensive that is. Um, people can also be one medical bill or accident away from not being able to afford having a boat anymore. People might also abandon their vessels because it's kind of easy to do. The fines for abandoning your vessel are $1,000 plus the cost of removal, but those can be avoided if you can't be tracked down. Not, not to give anyone ideas. Uh, <laughs> But many people do dispose of their vessels responsibly. Um, a lot of people also know that you're, you shouldn't be abandoning your vessel, so um, some people do scrape the CF number off of their vessel before abandoning it to try to avoid the consequences. Why are abandoned vessels a problem? Well, they can pose navigational hazards. They can leach chemicals and leak oil into the natural environment. They can contain hazardous materials or radioactive materials on board. They create public health and safety risks, and they can damage sensitive environments both through the release of pollution and by physically upsetting habitats or dragging along seabeds. And as many of you already know, the Delta is a very special place. It's home to more than 750 species of animals and plants, 100 of which are special status species. It's also the largest estuary on the west coast of North America. Hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, of agriculture come out of the Delta, and it's an important recreation destination. So understandably, reducing the amount of pollution that's in the Delta um, and eliminating obstacles to navigation and recreation is something that's important to a lot of us. And while my presentation is going to focus on vessels in the Delta, this is a problem that exists statewide. Um, and the Delta is the epicenter, but it's an issue everywhere. So just a little over a month ago, we saw a vessel in the news that really did a great job of illustrating the complexity of this issue. And that vessel is the Point Estero, which is pictured here. Um, and it's a commercial fishing, fishing vessel that ran aground um, near the Estero Bluffs State Park at the end of July. Um, and the vessel wasn't severely damaged, but it did get stuck on the rocks. And emergency personnel monitored the vessel for leaks and removed fuel and hazardous material. 
and tried to refloat the vessel, which was not successful. Um, the cost of removing the vessel was estimated to be about $170,000, and the vessel owner couldn't afford that and didn't have insurance. So you might wonder, how does the state deal with this kind of problem? Um, is there a program in place to deal with vessels when owners can't be found or owners can't remove, afford to remove a vessel? There is a, a network of federal, state, and local agencies that all work on this problem, and different agencies have the authority to address different issues or different parts of the problem. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Administ Atmospheric Administration, responds to vessels um, when a vessel is within or threatening a marine sanctuary. The Army Corps of Air Engineers gets involved when an abandoned vessel sinks or impacts a navigable channel. <coughs> The Coast Guard oversees the federal response efforts for the containment, re removal, disposal, and disposal of oil or hazardous substances released into marine environments. California State Lands Commission has the authority to remove abandoned vessels, but does not necessarily have funding to do that. The Office of Spill Prevention and Response, OSPR, who I'm interning with, is the pollution response arm of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So they're the state's lead for response to oil spills in marine and inland waters, and OSPR wardens respond to oil spills often. Counties, often the sheriff, sheriff's offices, do the actual removal of the vessels or will contract out with private companies to remove a vessel. And the Division of Boating and Waterways runs a reimbursement program that helps counties pay for the removal of vessels. If that sounds confusing and complicated, it's because it is. Um, there's a bunch of agencies that deal with this problem and no overarching program or funding source. When an abandoned vessel is found, contact with the owner is often attempted, and if the owner is located, he or she is responsible for the removal costs. However, as mentioned before, there's lots of reasons people abandon their vessels and people don't always, aren't always able to be located and aren't always able to afford removal. Um, also, as I said before, often the CF number is removed and that can really impede tracking down the owner. So while it seems like you might say, well, there's a boat and it's abandoned and the owner should pay for its removal and deal with that, it's, that's not, it's not actually that easy to solve. So I want to talk a little bit more about the Division, Division of Boating and Waterways program. Uh, so this is the state's official abandoned vessel removal program. It's the Surrendered and Abandoned Vessel Exchange Program, or the SAVE program. And uh, it provides grants for local public agencies to pay for the removal of vessels and the grants are awarded annually and can be used for the removal of recreational vessels only. There is no removal program that applies to all vessels overall or that exists for commercial vessels. And SAVE is made up of two kind of sub-efforts. Um, there's the Abandoned Watercraft Abatement Fund, AWOF, and then there's the Vessel Turn-In Program, or VTIP. So AWOF is a reimbursement grant program that provides funds for the abatement, storage, removal, and disposal of abandoned vessels. And VTIP uh, is a program that allows boat owners to turn in their vessel to a, to a public agency for free disposal. VTIP's pretty successful and uh, it's an important program because it seeks to prevent spills and prevent boats from being abandoned in the first place. And that's particularly important because um, it costs the state so much less to pay for a vessel, to dispose of a vessel that's brought to them before it's abandoned, than to pay for the disposal after a vessel is abandoned and maybe sinks or releases ha um, hazardous material into the environment. So something that's important to note is the Division of Boating and Waterways program makes a clear distinction between recreational and commercial vessels. So commercial vessels that include things like commercial fishing ships, shrimp trawlers, barges, and tugs. And recreational vessels include things like paddle boats, houseboats, sailboats, ski boats. And so SAVE covers the removal of recreational vessels. And this program is funded by several sources, including recreational registration fees, fuel taxes, uh, money from SB1. And the entire SAVE budget tends to be between one and three million dollars a year. The removal of Commercial vessels is often much more expensive because commercial vessels are um, larger and heavier usually, and that sometimes can require different equipment uh, for removal. And to, so to kind of put this in perspective, uh, the Spirit of Sacramento, which was about an 85-foot paddle wheel river boat um, that capsized near Bethel Island recently, it cost almost $2 million to remove. And so uh, you can kind of see if 
removing a commercial vessel like that was to be paid for by the SAVE program, it would blow the entire state's budget for the entire year. Um, something else to note is that while recreational vessels register with the DMV and therefore there's a mechanism exists to kind of for the state to get funding from recreational vessels, commercial vessels don't register for the state and so it's um, difficult to get them to pay into some kind of account that will pay for commercial vessel removal. So uh, this is a significant gap in the state's abandoned vessel program. And even with the recreational program in place, removal of recreational vessels is challenging. Um, a lot of counties have more abandoned vessels than they have money to put into their removal. And while VTIP seems to be a very successful program, um, I spoke with a lot of counties that don't have enough VTIP money to dispose of the vessels that people bring to them. One harbor master I spoke with said, you know, when you turn people away who come to bring you vessels through VTIP, you hope that they do the right thing, but you don't really know where those vessels are going to end up. And this brings us to the Office of Spill Prevention and Responses work. Because OSPR deals with oil spills and because OSPR wardens deal with abandoned vessels on nearly a daily basis, this is a problem that's of particular interest to them. And so OSPR is working to kind of better understand this problem in order to work towards developing solutions. And I'm working this summer with OSPR staff members on a few projects that are aimed at gathering more information on abandoned vessels. So the first question OSPR has been looking to answer is, uh, where are these vessels? And OSPR is seeking to answer that question through aerial surveys and on the water surveys. Last spring, OSPR did an aerial survey in order to create an inventory and track the vessels that exist in the delta. Inventorying these vessels is, is important because if, um, if we can track the vessels and if we can um, kind of have an, an idea of what's out there, we can uh, distinguish between legacy vessels and new arrivals, and we can also look at patterns of abandonment, figure out if there's hot spots, um, see if vessels show up during more during certain kinds times of the year, that, that kind of thing. Here's some of the results from the aerial survey. Every dot on this map represents anywhere from 1 to 12 vessels that was located during the survey. The survey was completed during 10 different flights, and those flights are indicated with the different color dots. And the survey was conducted by one of the OSPR wardens, Mitch Good, and so this is his data. Um, so the black line indicates the flight path, and the color is not really significant for this map. This map is just a different iteration of the previous map, but it shows you um, for each of those dots that, uh, for each of the vessels, it dis differentiates between commercial and recreational and also points out whether the vessel was floating, sunk, or on land. So the circles are commercial vessels, the triangles are recreational. You can see a lot of the vessels are floating recreational vessels, those yellow triangles. And so this is kind of difficult to see, but I have some graphics that I'm going to show you that breaks down this information further. So, oh, and as kind of a disclaimer, because each point on the map represented 1 to 12 vessels, there's kind of a range of possible vessels that we came up with uh, when we went through the data. So this is a very rough estimate, and uh, this is the low range of the possible n full number of vessels in the delta. So um, as you can see, about 20% of the vessels were commercial, and about 80% uh, were found to be recreational. This further breaks down the vessels by whether they were sunk, floating, partially submerged, or upside down. And then this graph shows the distribution of vessels across the five counties that were in the survey area. Um, as you can see, Solano County has the most vessels, and Yolo County has the fewest at 17. And these graphs uh, show the proportion of commercial and recreational vessels within each of those counties. So similar to the first pie chart we looked at, every county has about 20 percent commercial vessels and 80 recreational except San Joaquin County which has a much larger proportion of commercial vessels. And lastly this graph shows the same information that we just saw but um, all kind of in one place. So OSPR also conducted a water survey which occurred last week and the goal of that was to ground truth the data that was collected from the aerial survey and we haven't had a chance to process that data yet because it was only a few days ago but um, from what we saw it did seem like the points that were seen from the air were pretty accurate. This is one of the pictures we took during the on the water survey and what I like about this picture is that it shows how valuable an air survey is um, a lot of the vessels seem to be maybe nestled back in channels or hidden in the reeds, and um, those areas are hard to reach by boat, so 
um, conducting the water survey reinforced or illustrated the importance of doing an air survey because there's so many vessels that really can't be seen from the water. So because the aerial survey provided us with coordinates of the ADVs, or sorry, ADV abandoned derelict vessel, coordinates of the vessels in the delta, we were able to go through Google Earth and look through the historical imagery and see how long these vessels have been in the delta. Using the aerial survey data, I went through and found all of the commercial vessels and tracked each of them back in time. We found that the oldest vessel can be tracked back to 19, or 1939, which is the last year that a clear image exists on Google Earth for that area. Um, 24 of the vessels, of the 52 vessels, have been in place since year 2000, and in the last 10 years, between one and five of the commercial vessels that were observed in the aerial survey arrived each year. Again, this is a very, very rough average guess, but um, looking at the vessels in our survey, it seemed that there was an, about an average arrival rate of two commercial vessels a year in the Delta. And it's not super surprising considering there's not um, a ton of funding available or a program for the, the removal of commercial vessels, so it's not really surprising that once they show up in the Delta, they seem to kind of stay there. Um, something else we were able to see by looking at historical imagery was when vessels sank. And so this is a vessel that uh, was seen during the aerial survey and is out by Bethel Island. This image is from August 2012. The same vessel from June 2013. This is August 2014. August 2015. And March 2017. So that, that same vessel, it's, you can barely see it in this picture. Even though removal is challenging and funding really uh, doesn't exist necessarily for a commercial vessel removal. It's frustrating to see vessels sinking because that increases the cost of the vessel removal by several magnitudes. Using the aerial and eventually the water survey data, I'm creating an estimate of the cost of removing all the vessels from the delta. And this work isn't quite done yet, but I'll be wrapping it up in the next couple weeks. Um, the factors that influence the cost of removal, some of them are listed up here. So just to give you an idea that um, it can be it, they can, the removal costs can, can vary widely based on these factors. But based on a very rough look at the data that we have so far, the cost for removal for the 52 vessels found during the aerial survey, the 52 commercial vessels, is likely to be about over $15 million and maybe much more than that. So another thing that we're doing at Osprey this summer is looking at abandoned derelict vessel programs in other states to see if anyone's using an idea that could be applied in California. Um, and we're able to do this because this isn't just a problem in California. All coastal states really seem to be struggling with the same problem. And so NOAA has, um, NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration has a marine debris info hub, which is pictured here. And it's a pretty cool resource that shows uh, information about ADV programs across the country and, and shows whether they have, each state has a program, legislation, or funding that supports abandoned vessel removal. And so this summer, um, I in interviewed coordinators from Washington, Texas, Florida, Virginia, Maryland, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Oregon. And the purpose was to see if anyone's doing anything that could be applied here. And uh, my takeaway was that all states, uh, except Maryland, is doing great. Uh, all the states have huge challenges dealing with ADVs. And uh, limited funding seems to be an issue for all of these states. All of the states also seem to really struggle with dealing with commercial vessels. And while most of the states do have programs that cover both vessel types, commercial and recreational, um, most of the states don't actually focus on commercial vessel removal because it's cost prohibitive. Things up here that I haven't mentioned yet, um, a lot of states also have methods for tracking vessels. A lot of states are piloting vessel turn-in programs like the one California has. And only one program places a fee on commercial vessels to pay for vessel removal. And so the program that does that is Washington State's program. And they're really leading the pack as far as abandoned derelict vessel programs go. Um, they have several rules in place that are aimed at reducing the inflow of vessels that are abandoned in their waters. So some of the things that they do is they require marinas to require the vessels in those marinas to have insurance that will cover removal if the vessel sinks. Um, they have a secondary liability law which requires people who want to sell old and large vessels to get that vessel evaluated for seaworthiness before selling it. They also require people who are buying old and large vessels 
to have insurance for at least one year after the purchase is made. And they are also the only state that I found that keeps track of commercial vessels on a state level and also charges commercial vessels a fee that goes into a removal fund. And so they, they charge commercial vessels a $1 per foot fee uh, that goes towards uh, removal efforts. Washington has a lot of good ideas. Um, and however, aside from Washington, all the coastal states are, are really struggling with this issue and with commercial vessels in particular. So as I mentioned, a lot of states had tracking mechanisms, which is something else that we're looking into this summer. Um, because California doesn't really have a statewide tracking uh, platform for tracking abandoned vessels. They, uh, a lot of the counties uh, and sheriff's offices do have a very good idea of the abandoned vessels that are in their area, but there isn't really a comprehensive statewide mechanism. So here are some examples that other states are using. The bottom right corner is South Carolina's um, My Coast app. So they use an app that is given to the public and it allows the public to report abandoned vessels to the state government. The image above my coast is from Florida. Um, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has a derelict vessel map and when the officers find a, um, find a vessel and start opening the abandoned vessel report, they enter the vessel into this map, color code it based on whether or not it's a navigational hazard and then after the vessel is removed, they remove it from the map. Um, the image on the left is the uh, is NOAA's Environmental Response Management application. So that uh, allows federal and state agencies to track abandoned vessels, but doesn't have uh, a way for local agencies to add vessels into their database. Uh, so these could be some good things for California to explore. And so now that we've talked a little bit about the state's ADV issues uh, in depth, I wanted to circle back to the Point Estero and kind of uh, look at what happened. So um, the last thing that we talked about was that the Point Estero ran aground and that the owner couldn't pay for removal. So, um, so what happened next? Well, the Coast Guard and Osper oversaw the removal of oil and hazardous materials from the boat since, as we discussed, those are the agencies responsible for pollution prevention and the disposal of hazardous materials and oil. Uh, the vessel is aground off the coast of the Esteros Bluffs State Beach, but the vessel is not technically on State Park's land because it's below the ordinary high water line. <laughs> um, and that means that the boat is on land that belongs to the State Lands Commission. So while the State Lands Commission has the authority to remove the vessel, they don't have any funding to do the removal. Uh, the vessel is in San Luis Obispo County, so the county could remove it, but if uh, Slow County does decide to remove it, they can't apply for save funding because this is a commercial vessel, not a recreational vessel. So they can't be re re reimbursed through save. The removal cost was estimated at about $170,000, and as of September 1st, which is when I called the park to ask if the boat was still there. Um, the boat is still there and they haven't heard anything as far as plans for its removal. And so I wanted to bring up this vessel because it really illustrates the complications that arise um, that are related to kind of the patchwork of authority and funding that exists when it comes to abandoned vessel removal in California. Uh, abandoned vessels are a significant problem in California and California has the fourth largest number of registered boaters in the country. And so it's unlikely, or it's, the problem isn't likely to go away unless changes are made. And so OSPR and other state agencies are looking for solutions to the problem and exploring ways to address these gaps that exist in authority and funding when it comes to vessel removal. Using the information that's being gathered from the aerial and on-water surveys, using the results of the cost estimate, learning from successes and challenges other states are facing, and improving our ability to track vessels will hopefully help OSPR and other state agencies to understand the problem better and develop solutions to this complicated issue. I hope it's forwarded to all the legislators from all these counties that surround the Delta. There's a lot of political power in Contra Costa, Sacramento, San Joaquin, and Solano. And I'm not sure the various legislators know that this is an issue, so I hope you guys mm -hmm. do a nice job of putting it together and making sure that they're aware this is a big problem and perhaps they can work together to form a task force, something along those lines to then take that back to the uh, Capitol and push for legislation that way. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.
I am Annie Daly. I was giving a talk about abandoned vessels in the Delta. I'm from Stockton. This is my mom, who I'm very fond of, who is also from Stockton. Her name is Barbara Daly. And, and this is her as well. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce another Barbara Daly, who is an activist in the Delta. In Clarksburg. In Yes, thank you. Thank you for doing this today, Annie. It was a great talk. And it just so happens that this last week we submitted a grant proposal to the Delta Conservancy for Prop 1 money for water quality to uh, remove abandoned and derelict vessels from the Delta. So this was really a timely presentation, and you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck on your grant. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I do, 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 do.